book of Proverbs and go to chapter 17 and look at verse 6 read. Now, you know as we as we uh, as we uh, enter the marital stage and have children, and raise those children, and no doubt we make mistakes. Same thing is true with being a grandparent. Sometimes we make mistakes and so forth. But what I'm going to talk about today, uh, perhaps, will help you. Now, some of you are young and you think, well, that's a long ways off. Trust me, it'll be here before you know it. Be here before you know it. But some of us are full-fledged, hard man. Granddaddy service is called on. <laughs> <laughs> Grandparents, here's what the book of Proverbs says. The first part of verse 6 says this. Children's children are the crown of the old land. Let me read that again. Children's children are the crown of an old man and of an old woman. Let me add that to it. Grandparents, why are grandparents so wonderful? What is it that makes us different? Well, one thing, we went, we'd already been through the meal. We've been through the meal. We, over our lifetime, we've been there with our kids when they would have breakups, when they would have problems. And now, as years, went, as years has gone by, first of all, we've learned to love. We've learned how to love. It takes a while to learn how to love. You say, well, I couldn't love them anymore. But as time goes on, you learn how to to love. Another urgent thing is, with us that are my age and some of you a little younger than I, we do not have much time here. Our time is clicking away and, and most of their lifetime, our grandchildren, most of their lifetime will be spent without us. Will be spent without us. And then those grandkids, great grandkids, that's so nice and wonderful. Are they not? Are they not? They are so nice and so wonderful. Uh, but you know, the fourth thing is this. We don't have to put up with them all the time. We can just spoil them and send them home if we want to. The one fellow said the sweetest word in the English, in the English language is bye-bye, Papa. <laughs> faithful grandparents. Faithful grandparents are the key. I'll tell you, the key to me, the grandparents, we have a great responsibility and we can, we can help mold the world in a different direction. We can help mold the world in a different direction. Think of how you can influence. In Genesis chapter 5, we read about a man named Enoch. He was the son of Jared. He was the father of... He, he was the father of Lamech and Lamech was the father of Noah. And it did something right. He walked close to God. And the years went by, and here comes along his grandchild Noah. And it walked so close to God that God did not have to take him through the process of death, but God translated him right to heaven. So here's a man who's walking so close to God. Yes, as a little girl said, it's closer to God's house than it was to his house. And so he just went home with the Lord. But here these... Now remember, in these ancestors, one of them lived to be 900 years old. So a lot of years have passed by. And along comes Noah. Noah was a righteous man in his day. Now let me ask you, don't you think, don't you think that righteousness that Noah exhibited went back, some of it had to go back to that grandchild, to that grandfather, that grandfather in him. He was faithful to preach the gospel. Or not the gospel, but the message of God. He preached for 120 years. He preached for 120 years and only had eight people saved. Now most preachers would have quit before then. 120 years. But you got to consider who those eight were. Those eight were his own family. 
Folks, I know we're supposed to love everybody and we're supposed to love the souls of folks, and, and we do. But let's be honest now. That family is of the utmost importance. He preached all these 120 years. Only eight people got on that ark. Only eight people made the trip with him. Faith. Do you think that our faith affects our grandchildren? You better believe it does. You know, I think our faith affects our grandchildren more than it did our children. Me and Kate played a little game this morning. We uh, got on the phone and, and you know, asked that you know something. And we asked every grandchild what their name meant. It was hilarious what some of these names meant. And some, some were downcast and some were upcast. We got a big laugh out of, out, out of that. Here's what the writer of Hebrews says about Enoch. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained a witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. Grandparents, first of all, ought to be pleasing to God. If you're going to guide your grandchildren the way they are to go, and be an example to your children, be an example of those around you, You've got to live for God and to have a consciousness about God. Now then, look at the fruits from his life. First of all, the Bible says that he was a righteous man in a total corruptible age. Let me read you what the Scripture says in the book of Genesis. This is chapter 6, verse 8 through 9. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. And the Lord said, I will wipe mankind out whom I have created from the face of the earth. But listen to this. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a righteous, blameless man among the people of his time. And he walked with God. He was not swayed by the times. He was not, he was not handicapped by the fact that people may have laughed at him. What it may be all. He was not handicapped by that. He just kept walking with the Lord. Now he walked with the God to the extent that he did exactly what God told him to do. When he built that ark, he built it exactly like God said to do it. Here's what the Bible says. And back in Genesis, again he said that. So he made himself an ark of cypress wood, made rooms in it, and coated it with pitch inside and out. This is how you build it, God said. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet deep, with a roof on it, and finish the ark with 18 inches from the top, put a door in the side of the ark, and make the lower and middle and upper deck, make a free store out of it. And he built that thing exactly the way God had said do it. He preached righteousness. When God said this generation is right, I'm going to wipe all of them out. Now in the generation we live, you'd think God would say that, but we know we're like they were. We would be righteous compared to the folks that lived on the earth before the flood. And God said, I'm going to total wipe them out. But there was somebody, somebody who reverenced God and believed God. Now, Noah got on that ark. Never had rain before. Got all those animals that God had sent there. Loaded them up. Did not have a diesel engine. Didn't even have a sail. Didn't have a rudder. Didn't have a paddle. Didn't have a compass. Didn't have a GPS. He didn't have anything except this. Faith in God. And faith in God was enough. Now, let's talk about grandmas for a little while. Yeah, grandmas, wake up now. What about Timothy? What about Grandma Lois? Remember her? Remember what Paul said? Paul said that Timothy was like his own son. Here's what he said in 1 Timothy 1 5. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you. The word sincere means unpolluted. Pure faith. I am, I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. He went on to say, he went on to say this, and for this reason, 
I remind you to kindle a flame afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. Here's a young man that was like Paul's own son. Because he had been trained right. He started with his grandmother. She had faith. She passed that faith on to Eunice. And her and her daughter passed that faith on to young Timothy. Now the Bible doesn't say anything that I can remember about Timothy's dad. I don't know if it mentions his name or not. He may have, he may have been deceased. He may not have been in the picture. He may not have been believed in Christianity. But none of that stopped Timothy from being what God wanted him to be. We will influence our grandchildren in such a way that nobody else can. We can teach them to be respectful. We can teach them to be uh, humble before God. And we, bring, we can bring the Word of God to them in a quiet manner as we play with them and so forth. A school teacher asked her class of eight years old to write about a grandmother. And this is what one little eight-year-old girl wrote. She said, a grandmother is a lady who has no children of her own, so she likes other people's boys and girls. Grandmas don't have anything to do except be there. If they take us on walks, they slow down past pretty leaves caterpillars. They never say hurry up. Usually they are fat. But not too fat to tie shoes. They wear glasses and sometimes they take their teeth out. They can answer questions like why dogs hate cats and why God isn't married. They don't talk like visitors do which is hard to understand. Well they read to us they don't skip words or mind if it is the same story again. Everybody should try to have a grandma, especially if you don't have television. Because grandmas are the only groups who always have time. Oh, what an honor to grandmas. What an honor to grandmas. But you know, a lot of grandparents across the land don't get to spend time with their grandchildren. Some of the grandchildren live hundreds of miles away or hundred miles away. And to see them annually or monthly. And I can't imagine how that would be hard. As a matter of fact, surveys say that only 5% of children live close enough or are involved with their grandparents enough uh, to really have any kind of a lasting relationship. Some grandparents choose not to become emotionally involved with their grandkids. That blows my mind, man. Uh, that just totally blows my mind. So a poet wrote this about a child. He said, The Heart of a Child was the title of the poem. Whatever you write of the heart of a child, no water can wash away. The sands may be sh uh, shifted where the billows are wild, and the efforts of time may decay. Some stories may perish. Some songs be forgotten. But this engraved record, time changes it not. Whether you write in the heart of a child a story of gladness or care, the heavens has blessed, or the earth has defiled, will linger unbearingly there. Who writes it has sealed it forever. And a it must answer to God on that great judgment day. We're writing in the hearts of those children every time we encounter. Now let me give you some suggestions as a grandparent. Some things you do for your grandkids. Number one, teach them about God. You don't have to set them down in a formal setting. Okay, sit down here. I'm going to read the book of of first psalms or something like that. Go as you play with them. Do you know that Jesus died on the cross for your sin? Do you know that He rose from the dead the, the third day? You may not think they're listening. They may be running that monster truck at the same time you're talking, but it's sinking, sinking in. Got them toward good marriage. Got them to marry the right kind of person. If you got a habit, 
If you've got a habit of letting a bad word slip, don't let it slip in front of them. And if you've got a habit of smoking, don't smoke in front of them. They'll learn a lot more from what you do than what you say. Be consistent. Follow through with things. Don't be up and down. Don't fight. Don't fuss at grandma in front of them. Whatever you do, don't fuss at grandma in front of them. Play with them. Tell them you love them every single day. You see, good things, they remember the good things. Don't pressure to accept it. I know, I know, we want our grandkids to be the star running back, the star quarterback. Folks, God may have a better plan than that in mind. We want our little grand, our granddaughter to be the greatest cheerleader or the most intelligent girl in her class. God may have something more important in life. Believe in them. Believe in them. Believe that God's going to bless. Share your life with them. Always point them toward heaven. Talk straight to them. Even about sensitive things. Talk straight to them. But now, some things you should never do. Y'all mentally write this down. Even though you may be years away from having grandchildren, you write this down. And you remember what this old preacher is telling you today. First of all, never dishonor their parents. It doesn't matter what they are, what the world may look and see. They are. No, never, never in the presence of a child dishonor his parents. If you're disrespectful to the parent, the child will be disrespectful to the parent as well. Don't change the room. If little Johnny's got to be in the bed at 8 o'clock at home, he needs to be in the bed at 8 o'clock at my mom's and granddaddy's house. You see, if he don't eat chocolate at home, don't you get him a dozen Hershey bars. No, don't, don't do that. Grandparents, we have a problem. Now, we have a problem. Sometimes we look at those grandchildren like they are children. Folks, they are not our children. We are not number one in command. Those children belong to their parents. We are in the back seat. We are second in command. We are playing second fiddle. But I say to you, let's play it so sweet that it will make not only the child rejoice, but also the parent as well. Understand this. God has laid upon the parent the responsibility of this child. Not on the grandparent. God has laid it on the parent. Never correct a child in front of a grandchild. Don't say, why are you idiot? You are no better than that. You know what they'll do? They'll start disrespecting that, disrespecting that parent. They'll begin to think the way, the way you do. If there is a dispute, if there is a time when there is a divorce, you may take sides in the lawyer's office. But don't you ever take sides in front of that grandchild. You got to play both parents as good people. As good people. If you speak bad about a child, dad, or mom, you're speaking bad about them. Let me give you a thing here. Y'all remember me talking about Jonathan Edwards, a great English preacher. He lived between the time of 1703. He was born and he died in 1758. He lived 55 years. One of the most godless men. By the fact, the religious movement today has a lot. Uh, he was responsible for a lot of it. By the year 19 and uh, 1900, they ran a survey of his descendants. Now listen to this. At that point in time, he had 1,394 descendants, known descendants of Jonathan Edwards. A hundred of those became preachers and missionaries. A hundred became lawyers. Eighty become a public official. Seventy-five army and naval officers. Sixty-five college professors. 
60 doctors, 60 prominent authors, 30 judges, 13 presidents, uh, 13 college presidents, three United States senators, and one vice president, the third vice president of the United States, Aaron Burr. Hold on to Aaron Burr's name. Hold on to that. He was the vice president, the third vice president. His, his granddad, or one of his great granddads, was Jonathan Edwards. During that same period of time, there was a man named Max G. Max was a petty thief. He had 310 descendants at 1900. He was a, all 310 died paupers. 150 were lifetime criminals, locked away. 100 were drunkards. 7 were murderers. And more than half of the women were prosecutors. Folks, it matters how us grandparents, what kind of life we live. Now let's go back to Aaron Burr. He should be at the top of the list. He is Jonathan Edwards' descendant and he is vice president of the United States. But Washington got to him. 1804, the guy that was going to run against him for president, he called him to a duel and he shot him and killed him. Didn't get arrested for that. Didn't do about anything Washington <laughs> in, in the 1800s to get away with it. But later on, they, they convicted him of treason and sent him, sent him jail. I said that to say this. You can live as righteous as you want to. You can be everything God wants you to be. We can lay that out there for our grandkids. But you know what? It comes down to they have to choose our God. Amen. They have to choose the way that we live. Every 24 hours in America, every 24 hours, 3,000 children see their parents divorce. 3,000 every 24 hours. 1,629 children are put in adult jails every 24 hours. 3,228 children run away from home. It's so unpleasant, and in a lot of cases, they're sexually abused and other, abused other ways. 1,512 children drop out of school every 24 hours. 7,742 teens become sexually active. Now, let me close with a story. There was a guy named Pat. In a little town, he ran a pawn shop. And in this pawn shop was a little room he called Memory Hall. Memory Hall. He was in there working one day, and he was an older man. Everybody loved him and respected him. He was in, he was in Memory Hall fixing a lantern. And he heard the bell ring, and that bell on the front door was one of his prized possessions. He had it for he been in his family for a hundred years. It was a prized possession. He heard that bell ring, went out and see him, didn't see anybody he looked down. And there was a little girl. Old brown eyes looked up at him, smiled at him, said, I'm gonna buy something for my grandpa. And she looked around. He said, well, I got a pocket watch. I made it myself. He loved it. He said, no. She continued looking around. She went over close to the door and did the door like that. The bell began to ring. She looked up at the bell. And she said, I think my grandpa would like that bell. He said, sweetheart, that, that's not for sale. I, I've had it in my family for a hundred years. But as he would watch that little girl expression on it, they said, thought, wait a minute, all my pain is gone except one strained uh, strain daughter that I haven't seen and heard from in 10 years. So why not? So why not let her have this bell? We can be in a family where it can be passed on down and passed on down. She said, hey, sweetheart, I'm going to save you the bell. Boy, she's tickled to death. So she left it. That night he was in the he was in memory hall there polishing the, some of his work uh, working on a little toy train and so he cut off the light uh, he thought he heard the bell ring he said wait a minute that's ridiculous I sold that thing in a minute he heard the 
bell rang again. And the door came open. And there stood the little girl with a bell ringing. He said, did you change your mind? Do you not want the bell? She said, no. Granddaddy, Mama said it belongs to you. And her daughter and her mother stepped in and said, Hello, Daddy. Amen. There ain't nothing like grandchildren. There ain't nothing like grandchildren. And I want to encourage you to play with them, have fun, have fun with them, take them to football practice, live and die and live and sleep. Take them to charity with grace. Be there. Not only for your grandchildren, but be there for your children as well. As well. We're not going to have an invitation this morning. For the Preston, would you have a close of prayer?